Okay, so welcome back everyone for this uh, last panel of the day. And we had uh, two terrific panels uh, so far. And I think this is gonna be really our cherry on the cake to conclude our uh, our day um, here at Osgood and Nelanson Center. Uh, so for today's uh, last panel, we organized a round table. Uh, so it's going to be uh, a bit more a bit more informal than what we have done so far, and our, I will ask our speakers to uh, limit their first remarks to uh, eight to ten minutes, so that uh, we can follow up with questions and, and most importantly get questions from uh, from the audience. And we have a, a wonderful group of experts here, both from inside and outside Osgood, and I will present them. As they uh, as they take uh, as they take the floor, and this last panel uh, is entitled "Artificial Intelligence, Due Process, and Legal Ethics," and our idea is to uh, ask our experts how do they see artificial intelligence impacting on their own very field of expertise. So, uh, without further ado, our first panelist uh, today is the interim Faro. Uh, as you may have seen, um, the job of Adina Dosgood uh, is quite uh, is quite something, and we have asked uh, Trevor to be present from the start today, and he chaired. And now we are asking, and we are really imposing on him today, and so we are also asked to come and share some of his thoughts about. Uh, what is the impact of AI on legal education, but also Trevor is a leading scholar on the field of access to justice. So uh, I really look forward to hearing uh, what he has to say. Uh, Trevor, you have the floor and thanks again. Valerio, well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction, very kind. Um, so I'm going to try and stick with the instructions and be as uh, brief as possible. Um, I thought I would, I thought I would, would, Take the title seriously and think about legal ethics. But when I knew that uh, my my legal ethics colleague, um, Professor Amy Salzen, was going to is on the panel, and I don't think there's anyone in the country who can speak with more authority than Amy on this topic. I'm going to slightly go sideways to your invitation, Valerio, on something that I am thinking about a lot these days, um, which is on AI and legal education. Um, and the question uh, that I, I I'm really going to use my time in the in the spirit of asking questions actually because I'm I'm still trying to sort out what I think about these that I want to pose to the group and to the to the audience is um, in the age of AI what is the purpose of education and in particular legal education and coincidentally since becoming dean uh, I've been having lots of conversations with senior members of the bar who are increasingly asking a similar question, which is what is the purpose of the legal profession? Now, you know, we've got lots of statements uh, over, the, over the centuries about uh, trying to figure out what's the purpose of education. One statement that I found actually surprisingly um, appropriate for, um, it's surprising not because of where it's coming from, but because it's a conference on AI, uh, comes from a 1947 uh, paper that uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, wrote in the Morehouse College student paper on uh, the purpose of education. So well before the hallucinations of chat GPT became uh, mainstream, uh, King argued that education must enable one to shift and weigh evidence, to discern the truth from the false, the real from the unreal, and the facts from the fiction. Uh, as far as legal education is concerned, we've got lots of definition, definitions and thinkers. Not many of us will agree on any one. Um, one that keeps coming up, it's problematic, but I think it's it's around and continues to be, is this notion of teaching students to think like a lawyer. And I think no one better than uh, American scholar Fred Schauer summarizes that in the contested way that he does um, in his book on legal reasoning and this idea of learning analytical skills and applying a lot of facts. So fine. However, um, if ChatGPT or Copilot or whatever can essentially produce a shareholders agreement, an employment contract, a demand letter, an appeal factum in really just you know, a matter of seconds, the question then becomes, what's the purpose of teaching students the art of reading cases, sifting through facts, drafting legal materials, and engaging in that basic legal analysis? You know, one way to answer this, if we're not sure, is to go back to some basic back-end curricular design. And, and rather than starting with the, the question of and the focus on legal education, 
we could rather look at the question from the perspective of the needs of society and work back from there. So the idea is to take seriously the research on everyday legal needs and problems, the current state of society with all its ups and downs, strengths and weaknesses, and look at what knowledge, skills and attributes are needed to make meaningful contributions. So with that approach, I want to explore three different and very imperfect views or ideas about legal education to see what people think. And the first I'll call the criti critically engaged problem solver. Um, one theory is that we don't really need to teach the traditional tools of legal reasoning and black letter law towards contract property, et cetera. All that is basically just information that the students can now not only find online, but now they actually can ask Copilot to find it, sort it, apply it, et cetera, all with a couple of, of prompts. So on this theory, I think there's a strong question about could we dispense with some of that, what I'll call information gathering or given portion of law school and move directly to something else? And so what could that be? And the idea would be to move away from tasks that focus on information providing and help students move more directly in developing skills of higher order thinking. So I'm gonna again, go back to King, not for the last time, who said in the same essay, the function of education therefore is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. Uh, David Wilkins, American legal ethics scholar, um, push this idea, which is where I'm stealing the idea of this uh, this part of the paper, is shifting that idea of thinking like a lawyer to include that idea of thinking like a problem solver. So this isn't new. We do this, certainly speaking personally, in our first year ethics class, we destabilize this traditional notion of thinking like a lawyer, questioning uh, the analytic tradition's ability to address issues of pluralism, power, ethics, empathy, etc., Experiential educators for years have been have been working with the combination of theory, practice, and reflection to try and help students push further in terms of their skills of application, problem solving, and reflection. Um, it, you know, but if we go back to the question that law partners are asking, um, and 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 the idea of what's the goal of law school would be to help lawyers to essentially understand what is distinct about what clients need and to think and identify and develop the skills of counselor, problem solver, empathetic advisor, et cetera, or put in the currency of what uh, I thought a really interesting speaker at a, at a, con a cult workshop last year uh, argued the idea would be to basically teach students not to become articling stu students or junior associates, but rather to become partners. Now, I think there's a lot of merit to this. And as the theory goes, ChatGPT or some other LLM you know, uh, related uh, uh, platform would do the work of articling students, junior associates, and we can train humans to do the more interesting, important partner style work of problem solving and counseling. Fine. Um, however, you know, I think the problem with this approach and why I say it's imperfect on its own is that it basically is like trying to teach a first year music student to perform with the Toronto Symphony Orchestra without first helping them to learn the C, D and G minor scales. You know, And for any musician in the world, you learning to be a musician without learning scales and fundamental music theory is a real challenge. And so let me put that first approach aside for a second and come to the second imperfect vision, which is this idea that I'll call the back to basics approach. Um, and the idea of putting it in legal terms, asking a lawyer to assess the value of a given factum prepared by ChatGPT, you know, whether it's the right approach, the right factum, the right balance of facts and law, the right result, et cetera, is difficult if we don't know the basics on which that document is built. So it seems to me that there's something to building blocks. There's something to basics. There's something to apprenticeship. There's something to practicing those and and, and, and learning those fundamentals, um, which takes me back to the proposition that although certainly not sufficient, we likely need to be slow to fully abandon all forms of the basic when thinking about legal education. So if that's right, and if we need to continue to develop some, uh, to continue to develop uh, you know, notions of higher order thinking, of course, but also not abandoning the fundamentals, what about AI? Um, 
and clearly there's certainly lots of excitement. There's lots of concern. We've heard, heard lots of discussion about it, you know, in terms of its just impact on the legal profession and, and professions generally, the IMF has, has recently reported that about 40% of all jobs in the world will be affected by AI, uh, which is mostly going to be in, in what are termed by that on the, in the, these reports as white collar or professional ranks. Um, and there are a lot of people freaking out about that. Others say, wait a minute, we've seen this before and we'll just adapt. And, and you know, the idea uh, that many will remember the switch from manually sitting with bankers boxes of documents to those documents then being electronic and going through documents readers in order to produce affidavits of records or um, going through uh, with due diligence. Um, it's not that far away when those sorts of advances happened. Lots of people are saying, well, this is just another version of that. To me, I actually think it's something bigger. Uh, and I think it is a bigger deal than that, which takes me to the, the sort of third imperfect approach, which is this idea of an integrated approach uh, with AI and law. Whatever one thinks, I think we need to fully, and this is sort of where the claim currently is, that I think we need to fully embrace AI, AI as part of those basics, to integrate it, to experiment with it, to explore it, to develop it. Um, we're already doing quite a bit of that at law school. Uh, I can speak for Osgood, but I think we're at the front end really of understanding what will need to become essentially some symbiotic nature of a new relationship between law students, lawyers, legal technology, and society. And I don't think we're there yet. There's some really interesting research that continues to come out of the Uni University of Minnesota on different experimentation with uh, randomized control groups and the use of chat gpt and increasing success uh and then and then and then and then gaps so it you know getting to closing it's not whether i think we need to keep the basics it's not whether we need to develop higher order thinking and it's not whether we need to integrate ai i think those are all false questions uh those imperfect visions i actually think it's the balance and the relationship and the dialectic between them all which is the interesting question in which we're still sorting out and which needs critical attention now, um, which is where I'm really interested in the group's thinking. So perhaps I started with King, perhaps I'll end, who in the same essay again, um, concluded that intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. So, you know, as we're putting our curriculum together, not just for next year, not just for the next five, but, you know, next 10 years, I'm really interested to know what we're gonna do and where we should be with that balance and how we think through those higher order skills, that critically interesting and innovative uh, notions of AI, but not losing track of some of the core bedrocks that were built in, built on, that might take us back to some of the questions that Alan Hutchinson started the conference on with notions of justice and, and, and rule of law. So with that, I'll stop Valerio and, um, and pass it back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Trevor, and I really look forward to this uh, discussion. And the next of our speaker is Glenn Stewart. Glenn is the Executive Director, Professor and Regulation of the Law Society of Ontario. Uh, Glenn, we are really grateful that you could take the time to be here uh, with us today, and you have the floor. Thanks so much, Valerio. It's uh, great to be here, or virtually be here. Um, so, you know, when... Uh, when the, the topic of uh, AI and regulation was put before me, and uh, I consider regulation sort of a subset of uh, legal ethics or kind of a context for it, um, I, I sort of worried because I thought we have, we have, we simply haven't thought about that yet. Uh, and you know, how are we going to rethink how we regulate? How are we going to do things differently? We've got to reconstruct a whole system that we've been doing in Ontario for two 127 years, more or less the same way. But then, uh, and I was heartened to listen to Trevor, as, as always, that it's actually not a call to reconceptualize how we regulate, because it really gets us to think more about what is important about being a lawyer. And fundamentally, our regulatory model is about regulating individuals. And as people have expanded and created firms and had people working with them, our regulatory model still focuses on individual lawyers, individual paralegals, individual licensees, uh, abiding by certain ethical obligations. 
And the responsibility and accountability flows back through the individuals. We don't look at uh, the provision of legal services per se. We look at the individuals who are who are doing that. Um, and in that context, uh, AI is um, a great unknown, but conceptually, it is another associate. It is another assistant. It is a different piece of technology. And as we've evolved to learn about different technology uh, and evolved to learn about different responsibilities that people can do, uh, the regulatory framework is still about what individuals do and how they take responsibility for what's uh, going on within the scope of their uh, practice. And uh, I think probably the most important part to that is that uh, it's not open to lawyers to say, well, AI did it. Uh, I, I I put in them the stuff and they did it. I don't know who did it or where it came from, but this is what came out of the machine. And that's not an answer in our regulatory model. And that's probably a good thing in terms of anchoring uh, that responsibility. Uh, of course, most of you probably know that AI uh, sort of uh, stormed onto the regulatory uh, uh stage recently with a case out of BC that has not yet reached the, uh, right. well, it has reached the regulator, but they have not reached the decision on it, uh, involving a case where a, a lawyer relied on a series of cases, two of which were uh, uh, didn't exist. And uh, other than the in the uh, great imagination of uh, chat GPT. Um, and on the face of it, they looked convincing. They look like they were cases from the BC Supreme Court. Uh, they look like they were on point. And it turns out they they weren't. And ultimately, it was the lawyer who was held accountable. The decision that we've seen so far was a decision on costs out of the Supreme Court uh, that dealt with the uh, the motion. As it turned out, the, the lawyer with the fake cases actually was successful um, on the merits of the argument. Uh, even taking the taking the fake cases out of the question, um, but it was uh, uh, found that uh, it was her responsibility to ensure that that hadn't happened, uh, and even her own counsel in the case uh, said it was presumptively negligent that this was allowed to uh, to have happened, uh, and really the essence of the analysis by the court was on uh, was starting from that basis and looking at what did this individual as a lawyer have to do in terms of her, meeting her obligations to the court and as a as a lawyer uh, when doing uh, research with chat GPT. And uh, as it turns out in her situation, she uh, and the court accepted, hadn't looked at what the risks were, hadn't looked at what the benefits were, hadn't looked at sort of the cautions, uh, had done it really on a bit of a flyer. Um, and uh, that was ultimately the basis on which the court said, uh, you're going to have to be responsible for, for some of the costs that were wasted because the other counsel made a great deal about having to uh, run around and try and figure out that these cases weren't actually real. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's interesting that the uh, sort of ultimate conclusion of the court was that there is no substitute uh, for the professional expertise that the justice system requires of lawyers. And the court said confidence in the selection and use of any technology tools, uh, including those powered by AI is critical. The integrity of the justice system requires no less. So it's interesting on the one side that this framework is set up that uh, there are expectations about how uh, AI is used. And uh, I guess the, the stricter and the the glass half empty part of, of regulation in terms of what uh, lawyers needed to do to make sure that they didn't succumb to the risks and dangers of AI. But it, it's interesting that uh, from a professional perspective that the flip side is that there is actually an obligation on lawyers to look at AI and to ask themselves some of those questions. Um, and although it uh, usually traumatizes many uh, uh, many lawyers, uh, to know that there is actually an obligation to adapt as part of the obligation uh, to be competent. Uh, 
there is an obligation to be diligent and cost effective and timely. And what that means, and, and the commentary to the rules, uh, talk about the role of technology uh, and the need to, to look at that and to use it. And uh, you know, <laughs> I, I have to say that not all lawyers are great with this. Uh, at the Law Society, we still deal with a portion of licensees who do not use email. I'm a little troubled to even say that. I don't understand it. I thought we were actually moving past email to the next generation of technology, but we've got a few who, <laughs> quite, quite frankly, uh, I'm constantly amazed, say, sorry, you, we cannot, I cannot communicate with email or I will have my assistant email you. Um, not that there's any gender overlay in any of that uh, sort of characterization. Um, so, uh, you know, this is this is a challenge. And uh, the question about how much AI does one have to bring into their practice? Uh, how does one do it? Subject to this other sort of counterbalancing uh, force about needing to be cautious is an interesting question. And one that we continually... Uh, we'll be struggling with, I think, for some time as we figure out uh, where that balance is. But all going back to the idea that ultimately uh, the fundamental uh, responsibilities of the lawyers, as Trevor's touched on, uh, remain the same in terms of uh, being an individual responsible for serving uh, the public and clients. Thank you very, very much, uh, Glenn. This was uh, terrific. And again, I look forward to the discussion. And our next speaker is Professor Emi Salazin from the University of Ottawa. Uh, Professor Salazin is one of the nation uh, leading experts in uh, the issue of the, uh, using technology to delivering legal services and what uh, comes out of there. Uh, Professor Salazin, you have the floor. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, so I think as was noted, my my kind of perspective background is in legal ethics. And I've been thinking about how technology intersects with uh, lawyers' duties of um, competence, lawyers' duties of confidentiality, all those core duties for a while. And I've done some writing about that. Um, we also have some good information coming out from different law societies across Canada about how AI implicates some of those core duties. Um, I thought I'd use my time today to build on, you know, some of what uh, Trevor and Glenn were talking about and step back a bit and talk kind of about three broad areas or themes or, or reasons why I think, you know, the legal profession as a whole needs to be engaged with AI and needs to be building literacy with respect to AI. Um, the first reason is really just because of the increasing ubiquity of AI, um, and in particular, the increasing ubiquity of generative AI. Um, we're seeing more and more generative AI become embedded in uh, uh, tools that lawyers use on a day-to-day -day basis. So some people may, may have seen that LexisNexis, a common legal research platform, has its uh, new product, Lexis Plus AI. Ken Lee is experimenting with AI um, having AI case summaries. Um, practice management tools that are commonly used are building an AI functionality. Um, even kind of non-legal tech software, so we're seeing word processing, um, build in generative AI capabilities. If you use Zoom, uh, which we're using today, um, sometimes you'll see uh, with certain accounts, a new AI companion pop up on the screen with you. Um, my Adobe Acrobat informed me last week or so that it wants me to try out its generative AI uh, functionality. Um, this is coming to computers. Microsoft announced on some new computers, they're going to change the keyboard and have a whole new button just to launch its AI chatbot. And yeah, I can give more and more examples. The point here, you know, really is that, you know, this technology is coming to lawyers, whether or not they seek it out or not. Um, and I think that ubiquity kind of building on what Glenn was talking about, we have such a, a range of pre-existing comfort and literacy with technology, I think that ubiquity is going to make it all the more important that everybody is engaged and building that understanding of, you know, not only benefits, but also risks and limitations. Um, it's not going to just be those that are, you know, super techie or super enthusiastic about technology that need to make sure they know um, how this technology works. It, it's really going to be everyone because, you know, what's happened, what's going to happen when you press that button on your keyboard 
or when you pull up a video conferencing tool and the new default is to have an AI companion with you. Um, lawyers are gonna to need to, to know how to, to engage that technology effectively. Um, and, and I think, you know, we are seeing regulators across Canada start to build, um, you know, some of that guidance for lawyers. We're seeing more CPD events. And I think that's all really productive. Um, so there's that ubiquity piece. Um, second reason I, I think that, you know, this is a profession as a whole issue is that lawyers have ethical obligations in relation to the administration of justice. Um, so we talk about legal ethics. We often, you know, first go to ideas like competence or confidentiality, communication, kind of those things that lawyers may use in their day-to-day -day practice. But lawyers also have ethical duties to try and improve the administration of justice, uh, which includes a basic commitment to the concept of equal justice for all within an open, ordered, and impartial system. Um, some pretty lofty words, um, but those are words that are actually in our codes of professional conduct. Uh, they're not just this kind of philosophical ideal that you know, legal ethics professors may want to talk about in class. We do have these obligations in relation to the administration of justice. And I think it's really important we start thinking about what that means in the context of AI. Um, to me, I think it means we need as legal professionals to be actively engaged with seeking out opportunities about how we might use technology better to close that access to justice gap. Um, we could do a whole conference on kind of various nuances of technology and access to justice. It's not a black and white story, but there are there are untapped opportunities there for sure. Um, alongside those opportunities, there's there's risks. Um, I think we need to keep our critical hat on as legal professionals as well. Um, comes to generative AI, AI kind of as a whole, there's a lot of broader ethical questions in relation to you know privacy, appropriation, environmental impacts misinformation, disinformation, bias concerns, labor issues. And I think, you know, those broader ethical questions are for the legal profession to be looking at as well, not just maybe scholars working in the area of AI ethics. Um, we need to make sure we're on the lookout for uses of AI that aren't consistent with our values. Um, I think that's part of our responsibilities as caretakers of the administration of justice. Um, I think courts are going to face a lot of pressure to bring on AI solutions in the name of efficiency. And I think you know, there's a lot of work to be done with our courts to, to make them use technology more effectively. Again, this is another area, though, where I think we need to be careful um, that we're we're not risking some of those core values that are embedded in our justice system. And it, that's not just for courts and the judiciary to figure out. I think the legal profession needs to be engaged as well. And in order to be engaged, we do need to make sure that we do kind of have this profession-wide literacy. Um, so I talked about kind of ubiquity. Everybody needs to know what this technology is because it's on their computer talked about, you know, secondly, our broader obligations in relation to the administration of justice. Um, third and finally, one thing I've been thinking about more and more are questions of independence, independence of the bar, independence of courts, and how that intersects with technology. I think, you know, in talking about AI, um, you know, one thing that can be missed um, is, you know, just the degree to which humans are involved in building these tools. Um, whether or not it's training a, a large language model to give better answers or use better language, whether you're building in certain guardrails, whether or not whether you're you know essentially rewording people's prompts to put it in a form that you think is going to work better for the tool, what data is being included. Um, there's all these elements of human intervention. Um, and we certainly need that human intervention, otherwise, these tools are not going to be usable for us. Um, I do think though, as we start using these tools in legal services context and the justice system context, when they start having a greater role, you know, in determining what languages and contracts or pleadings, legislation, maybe even judicial decisions, uh, how, when they start kind of dictating or helping us communicate with clients, um, I think we do need to make sure we have an awareness that the language that the tool is producing is not just, you know, zeros and ones. Um, it's it's a product of prior choices made by humans, um, and potentially humans that are from a fairly small set of private entities. Um, and it's not that I mean to be, you know, dramatic about this. I don't, you know, don't think there's some kind of nefarious, um, you know, strategy at play here. Um, but I do think there's some subtle things we need to be concerned about. Um, the point really here is that no technology is neutral and there's humans involved in building it. Um, and when we're talking about something like the law, which is a public good, which is so important, I think we we must keep kind of inside the, the reality that humans are building these tools. Um, and when we start using those tools to shape the law, 
those choices, the decisions those humans have made then become part of that law as well. Um, and again, in generally right now we're seeing, you know, private interest being kind of at the forefront of developing these tools. Um, so I think just a cautionary note to end on is, you know, how much are we offloading to the private sector? Um, are we making um, strong enough um, demands for transparency? Uh, is another, I think, good question to be always keeping at the forefront because uh, I think this technology is here to stay. Um, but we also, as a legal profession, need to make sure that our, you know, service in the public interest stays kind of at the forefront. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it with those three points. And I look forward to any questions and, and hearing from the rest of the panelists. Thanks for the time. Thank you so much. Uh, again, uh, this was uh, terrific. And uh, uh, just a reminder to the audience that they can send us Q&A uh, questions also for for this panel. So you're very welcome to uh, write them uh, in, uh, in the Q&A. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Professor Patricia McMahon, and she's at Osgood with us, and she's our resident expert on civil procedure, uh, legal history, and uh, law and equity. And Professor McMahon, thanks again for joining us, and uh, you have the floor. Thanks so much, Valeria. I really appreciate the uh, the opportunity to talk about uh, two of my favorite things, um, civil procedure and, in fact, legal history. And it might seem a bit strange to be talking a little bit about legal history when we're talking about cutting edge technology. But part of it is to underscore that as a profession, um, we're pretty adaptable and we've changed a lot as a profession, notwithstanding the fact that we have a perception that we do things the way we've always done them. In fact, um, things have changed quite a bit over the past couple of hundred years. Um, never, never is this more true when it comes to civil procedure. Um, and in particular, um, I'm gonna talk about one aspect of legal process and civil procedure, where I think we see a really profound impact uh, of change and with technology in particular, and that's on the discovery process and how important it is, how vital it is to moving litigation forward and resolving disputes. So whether it's, you know, um, we've all talked about these cases now, the BC lawyer sanctioned by the Law Society for relying on cases fabricated by or hallucinated by ChatGPT, or Michael Cohen, Donald Trump's lawyer, uh, for using fake cases in his submissions to the New York State Court. Um, the concerns about the use of AI in litigation abound, and they should. But I think it's also really tempting to think of these as new problems. They're not new problems. We've always had a problem with fake case citations. Look at Law Society disciplinary proceedings. People invent cases from, from judges, they do. Um, people also misconstrue what's in cases, which happens far more regularly, far more frequently um, than anybody would like to believe, but it's actually a big problem. And it's one of the reasons we have professional obligations to avoid misleading the courts. Um, if it were a given that one ought not mislead the court, perhaps we wouldn't need an affirmative rule that requires us not to do so. Um, but when it comes to something like the way AI can solve some of our problems um, and things like discovery of documents. I'm gonna focus more on the positive and less on the negative about fabrication and hallucination uh, and that sort of thing. And I'm gonna talk about the way discovery has evolved. And I'm gonna talk about a little bit how technology has been used to solve the problems that in many respects, it's also helped to create. I did have a picture, but I don't think I'm going to share my slides. I did have a picture of what discovery used to look like in the 19th century. And to give you a little bit of background, discovery is actually a tool of equity. It's not part of common law. It comes from chancery. And it comes from chancery because it was meant to be discretionary. And it was meant to be at the discretionary of the Lord Chancellor, who would, um, on the request of a party, permit them to use documentary evidence. So we take it as a given because we produce documents all the time, and we have a very broad notion of what constitutes a document, we have this sense that it's always been that way, and in fact, it hasn't. But discovery was so important in Chancery that even though when we had two separate courts of common law and, and equity, um, litigants in common law would actually go to Chancery and ask for permission to get documents that they could bring an order that they could enforce in common law. When that proved to be too difficult, too time consuming, too expensive, too cumbersome, um, there was a push to give common law judges that power. And so the profession adapted, the judges were given that power, and it streamlined the process for a little bit. When that proved to be unworkable, the courts were combined. And that's why we have a single superior court. We don't have courts of common law and courts of 
um, of equity anymore unless you're in Australia and they've got rules to deal with that too. But um, it's different. And that's one of the reasons why it was fused because of the power of discovery, because it was so important to actually um, help people settle cases, to help resolve cases, to help get to, to fact finding and truth seeking, right? Which is ultimately what we're hoping to get out of um, disputes that are before an adjudicator. Now, of course, the cost of discovery is enormous, but it's always been enormous. It's always been an obstacle. And, you know, I saw something that said recently that about 98% of cases are now settling before they actually get to a trial. That's something we need to think about. It means that the these pretrial procedures are really important. And the more we can know early on, the better off we're going to be. And so as between the cost of settling or the, the number of cases that um, are really settled before trial and the cost of discoveries, well, it's turning out that cost of the cost of discoveries is among the most expensive parts of civil litigation. Now, um, I've seen estimates that range from, say, 50% of the cost of litigation to upwards of 75% of the, the expense associated with litigation. That's an enormous barrier um, for litigants. It's an enormous barrier for people resolving disputes on their merits instead of just because they've run out of money. And we want to make sure that more people are able to resolve their disputes um, on the on the proper grounds, on the on on factual grounds, right? So one of the things I really am interested in when it comes to um, the use of technology and discovery, it's an expensive process, it's a time consuming process, and yet we've adapted to go from having um, parchment papers that were written out by hand, we've now got documents that were photocopied and generated by computers and filed away in filing cabinets. Um, we've dealt with that process by sort of making the discovery process more routine in courts, right? It came to the point where it became too much of a burden for the courts to serve as a barrier, to serve as a check, to serve as a, a way of approving um, productions for discovery. And so we left it to the parties to produce documents on their own. And so we came to assume that parties would produce everything that was relevant and they would manage the litigation. And with that, courts stepped back from it and they kept they stepped back from the oversight of this process. But in fact, the process began with a great deal of oversight and a great deal of administrative support. We've lost sight of that. And I'm, I think that the use of technology allows us to really reconsider what role do courts have to play in all these? What, what rules do we do we want to establish to level the playing field? And as the as the process of discovery became more and more cumbersome, more and more document intensive, more and more um, burdened by data, this problem was created by technology. We think about um, going from a big box full of uh, a big room full of boxes and boxes and boxes of paper documents to um, a whole collection of computers with gigabytes and terabytes of data. Well, now we've got the opportunity and we've had the opportunity um, to use technology to help um, resolve some of those problems by not just, not just reviewing the documents. They don't review documents on their own. But this has been an iterative process over the past 20 years. It's nothing new. What is new is um, the opportunity to have um, artificial intelligence, AI, more broadly available so that, quite frankly, more people can benefit from this as a possibility because we've had e-discovery for about 20 years, 15, 20 years. But the problem is that it's very expensive. It's expensive to have that kind of data, right? We've, we've taken it out of the hands of the parties um, to pick and choose what they're going to produce because we don't necessarily think that um, parties will produce uh, documents that maybe aren't in their favor. So we've taken it out of their hands. But as a result, hosting terabytes of data is really expensive. So is the document review process. With the greater access to um, artificial intelligence, there's the possibility of more open access, more open tools that are less expensive, easier to use, more manageable, and quite frankly, aren't concentrated in the hands of the really wealthy parties who have um, a lot to gain for it. It's, um, it's such a powerful tool to have opportunities for discovery, but courts have been really reluctant to expand the opportunity. I know in Ontario, small claims court doesn't have that as, a, as an available option. And yet having access to say the contents of someone's phone 
um, or the contents of someone's email, if they're trying to resolve a, a fairly low stake suit, might actually expedite the process because we'd have better information, which was the purpose behind discovery in the first place. And so I'm actually um, quite optimistic that in the right hands, if we get in, in front of it, if we embrace technology and change, recognizing that we're adaptable and change change always comes with the legal profession, but we tend to follow, we tend not to leave. Um, if we were to embrace this, um, I think there's the opportunity to um, really revolutionize the way we litigate, the way we resolve disputes in a way that works out with a, a better, uh, more cost-effective result for, for litigants. So that's what I'm thinking about when it comes to AI. I see it as a, a, continu a continuity um, with a lot of change and adaptability with the profession, as opposed to um, something that's going to eliminate jobs. But it is going to mean that, as Trevor was suggesting, um, that lawyers are going to have to actually um, know how to think about the law, and they're going to have to know how to ask the questions that have to be asked, because um, computer-assisted learning, Cal, technology-assisted review, um, it doesn't teach itself. We have to teach it, and we have to be able to ask the questions and to review the the, the product at the end, we can't simply depend on uh, machines to do all the work for us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Trish. Um, again, a wonderful uh, and thought-provoking presentation. And uh, the next uh, in our lineup are uh, Professor Richard Ed uh, and uh, Stephen Falford. So Stephen is a JD student here at Osgood, and Professor Haig is also at Osgood, and uh, where he teaches constitutional law, public law, and equity and trust. Uh, you have the floor, and again, you have combined uh, 10 minutes uh, for, for your remarks. Thanks again. Thank you, Valerio. Thanks to the, the everybody who uh, organized and made this thing happen. Uh, I'm just here to introduce our talk, basically, and then I will pass it over to Steve. My intro is a short chronology of how Steve and I came to do what we're actually doing. We're empirically assessing ChatGPT, and it's currently a work in progress, which we hope to get a paper from. So for me, ChatGPT only became a, a kind of thing in late in, in 2022, in December, uh, about a month after its release. I was scheduled to teach the second half of Osgood's 1L public and constitutional law course coming back from sabbatical. And right away, I wondered about the power of uh, ChatGPT for lawyers, for law schools, and concerns uh, regarding students and how they might use it. So I'm in, in an early class, I mentioned this new thing called ChatGPT pretty early on, and Steve was in my class. Uh, I think it was about a week or so later, I mentioned ChatGPT in class again. And this time Steve came up to me after the class was over and basically said, I didn't know, I didn't understand these large language models. And he sort of set me right, or sort of is the operative words there. Uh, in February 2023, I sent an old exam question to ChatGPT. I got an answer. It wasn't great. It was really a low B. I could prompt it to do a bit better, but those prompts basically required knowing the answer in the first place. Then we get May 2023 when that famous The New York Lawyer files briefs using ChatGPT. And it turns out that it made up cases. June comes along of 2023 and the call for papers for this conference. And so the next day I emailed Steve and I said, I have an idea for a proposal, but wondered if you'd be interested in assisting since I know that you know more about this than I ever will. Uh, my idea, very nascent at the time, was to assess ChatGPT empirically to try to understand its accuracy or that lack thereof. At the time, I only had a framework for how we might do this. And then in September, when school started up again, Steve proposed doing an independent research paper with me. And, uh, and then that, that began the project to take shape as an empirical assessment of chat GPT's ability to do basic legal work. And that idea has come to be a bit of a reality. And I'm going to pass it over to Steve right now to explain what he actually, what, what we've done. Thank you, Professor. Um... So yeah, so what, what we've done is, as Professor Haig has mentioned, an empirical study. Um, so during this short talk, I'm uh, just going to go through three main things, focusing on the first two. 
uh, which is just what did we do and why it's important that these sorts of studies uh, continue to happen and what are some of the findings so far? We are still going, so, uh, you know, but we do have some data to share already. Um, so one of the reasons why empirical studies are going to continually be important is because large language models and other forms of AI that are based on neural networks are in some ways uh, quite inscrutable. They, um, the way they operate and are built upon a hundred, in case of ChatGPT, a hundred more than a hundred billion parameters, and then how those are then used to mimic and op be slowly and gradually optimized to mimic uh, the speech and, and the training data they work on is such to result in a product where we don't exactly know how it produces any one answer. Uh, it's not open to just look at the code and and find out uh, that way, but uh, it, it kind of becomes a true black box, even to the founders, as this is a slide cut out of uh, Andre uh, Karpathy's uh, discussion, who's an open AI founder. Um, we don't exactly know how it comes up with the answers it does. So we turn to empirical studies, just like we would with any human. Uh, we would do uh, psychological studies have a different place than than neuroscience and, and looking at brain tissue. Uh, so we developed this, this study where just on a really broad level, um, we standardized uh, 77 questions. So that would be uh, across seven different question types and 11 question categories. So those would be, um, in this case, we might ask for an analysis of a particular case where... Um, where the full neutral citation was provided and see how ChatGPT does on that, or might ask for, uh, for example, a suggestion for, for what to read to learn about a topic. Um, and then we asked that across 11 different domains of law to get a good broad set to see if there's any differentiation between how it handles different areas of law that it might may or may not be more or less difficult. Uh, some of the results so far... Uh, indicate quite quite a wide range of responses. Those those seventy seven questions are asked across five different accounts, and they're asked every month. and uh, And so we have more than fifteen hundred responses. And, uh, and the interesting thing is 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 with the same question, um, ChatGPT can give quite a wide range of responses. Uh, sometimes you can learn a lot just by asking ChatGPT the same question many times because it, uh, and across, across new sessions and, and whatnot, because you often start to see the outliers or the strange contrivances come up and even asking the same question can help eliminate those. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna show a few more slides about the data. Um, we also see here that there's been uh, quite, you know, a small trend, I guess, in improvement across ChatGPT 3.5. We do have an account tracking ChatGPT 4 as well. But um, one of the more noticeable things about this graph is the 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 shrinking error bars, where the st standard deviation in the in the quality of the answers seems to be going down, um, both in terms of its good an best answers and its its worst answers are they're disappearing a little bit, and instead it's becoming more consistent. Uh, a good example I wanted to talk about for why ChatGPT can be unreliable in its answers uh, is in this case of a question where we ask for an ideal jury instruction. ChatGPT functions in a way where it sort of treats all of its training data set the same, and it builds um, a predictive model to mimic what it is in its training set. But in the in law and the way we approach legal research, there's sort of a superstructure where we look at uh, certain cases as more relevant than others, namely courts of, of uh, that are like the Supreme Court as greater than the Superior Court and more recent cases as generally of greater weight than, uh, than earlier cases. So 25% of the answers for this question about proper jury instruction or even an ideal set of jury instruction, uh, the AI references moral certainty. And moral certainty was advised by the Supreme Court back with, in Lifchis in, in the late 1990s that it that it's really an inadvisable uh, term to be used. So it, it really shouldn't be fitting in with an ideal set of jury instructions. And what maybe likely is happening here is moral certainty was still used in a lot of decisions. Um, and throughout the the full, what was likely the full training set, the ChatGPT 
was trained on. So it doesn't have a way to, with absolute certainty, discount those because it's not applying any sort of any sort of superstructure to its training data. Though this might this sort of problem could be theoretically uh, resolved pretty quickly with something like LexisNexis AI, where the the training goes through a second stage of what we call fine tuning, and perhaps a superstructure or something like that could be applied through some sort of fine tuning without having to specifically uh, generate the neural network in a different way. One of the the last things I wanted to point out is just some of the improvements we've noticed with the AI. Uh, one has gotten a lot better at putting out disclaimers that a legal professional should probably be involved. Uh, with the question, with particular questions, though it still often offers an answer. But Mabin, in, as is on the slide here, was one of those cases where the ChatGPT just has no idea what this case was or anything about it. So it would contrive hallucinations to answer it. Um, but it's gotten a lot better, probably through um, added fine tunings and updates, at just recognizing that it doesn't know its answer. It assumes it's just because it's not within its original data set, which it, it must not have been. Um, but that's uh, that's definitely an improvement that we like to see, especially for uh, those that would be attracted to use this, such as uh, self-represented litigants will more often than not be attracted to using something like, like ChatGPT instead of going through the owner's work of doing their, research, their own research or um, paying a lawyer to do it. And secondly is students will um, at least not be thrown down wild rabbit holes as they try to use ChatGPT as a place to start with their research. But uh, I see that I'm I am late on time, so that is uh, our presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Stephen and 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 Rich. Uh, thanks again. Um, so uh, the next speaker in our panel is uh, Professor Pina D'Agostino. And Professor Pina D'Agostino is an IP expert here at Osgood, but actually she is also one of the, if you want, AI masterminds of uh, York and Osgood. Uh, she uh, and it's impossible to 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 list all the things that she does uh, when it comes to AI. Uh, but suffice it to say that she's the vice director. Uh, if I'm not wrong, Pina, you correct me, uh, of Connected Minds, which is a multi-million dollar grant that she's, uh, she's managing with other people uh, at York and Queen's University. And I have asked Pina to come here and talk uh, to us, uh, if you want, about the impact of AI on legal research and what she thinks um, this will change for us. So Pina, you have the floor. Thanks again. Thank you, Valerio. It's such an honor to be here. Thanks for your leadership in Barnales. I know these conferences are a ton of work, uh, so it's uh, great to be here and really uh, Osgood leading in this conversation. Now, um, I wanted to chat about uh, the CFREF. Yeah, you talked about it's multi-million, $318 million. So this was a historic uh, grant uh, really that landed in at York University. And so what I thought I might do is touch a bit about that and really look at um, the varying research collaborative initiatives within the university to really lift up many of uh, our projects and the work. It's incredible, the diversity, and Trevor, you made this comment earlier in terms of the variety of uh, you know, work and different applications on AI that, that is really going on in this space. So um, let's start with the CFREF and see where, where that takes us. Um, so 380 million connected minds, so the title, and we labored over the title, and, and we know that it's always figuring out the right title to convey the right message. So it's connected minds, neural and machine systems for a healthy and just society. And I was really big on ensuring that the term just was in there because that's really where the law plays a central role. And this is really a fund where uh, the Canadian government, every seven years, they give money uh, to um, various universities. In this case, uh, we were one of 11 of the lucky ones um, to really try and look at, um, lift up the work of researchers in the STEM field, society, 
and really infuse our work with money to pay our students and come up with creative ideas so that we could lead uh, Canada, so Canada First Research Excellence Fund in, on a global scale. Um, in this case, we had, this is a collaboration with Queen's, and it's important that um, the law plays a central role. And this is a testament to the nominated uh, PI, which was Doug Crawford, and he was a neuroscientist. He is a neuroscientist. He's on sabbatical now, um, and he really wanted to ensure that the societal impacts and the legal piece played a nascent role in a project, and it was not just an afterthought. So I'm, I was very honored to be called on and I served as the inaugural vice director. And as of March 1, Valerio, I'm uh, now the director of the fund. Uh, and so in a sense, this is where the law is playing a pivotal role. And I'm really big on flying the access to justice flag and ensuring that ethics are, and the law and policy is thought out at everything that, that we're doing. Because in many ways, and maybe some of you could talk about this too, and something I put to you, but the law is always an afterthought. So computer scientists, the tech experts, they salivate when they come up with the next big tech and they want to make sure that it ensures widespread adoption and they keep tweaking it. You know, ChatGPT, we've seen various iterations. And the, the law or what happens to society, how it affects underrepresented communities, how it sidelines many communities, that's never really thought about. So um, law and ethics are typically seen as barriers to innovation and research and not as enablers. And I know I've been on many a grant and I refuse to be like the ticked box now where you have them all come together, all the computer scientists, all you know the tech experts, and then they call on me as you know the last one to make sure that the society piece is ticked off and that they have a lawyer in the room. Well, no, thank you. It doesn't work that way anymore. And that's why with Connected Minds, the law is an integral piece at a nascent stage, right? And that's so important when we're thinking of these complex questions and not to have the law come you know, at the 11th hour and try to figure things out, or we get into messy access to justice questions because we end up in the courts and this doesn't serve anyone uh, justice. So in a sense, these issues need to be thought of in a more cross-disciplinary way and no better place, right, than you're at York. Um, within Connected Minds, we've had seven faculties come together and we have three organizing pillars. So we call them like on the one hand, we have society, then we have neuroscience and behavior, and then we have intelligent technologies where AI plays a central role. Now, what's interesting about this project is the neuroscience bit. And I heard it come up once, maybe or twice, neuroscience. But really, neuroscience is still struggling to figure out, right, the science of the brain. And here we are uh, mapping on the brain onto machines. So this intermingling now of humans and machines and machines and machines is creating this techno-social collective that we talk about in our grant and in our work. And we're still trying to figure that out. So we need a multiplicity of partners coming together and a special focus on underrepresented communities and especially indigenous communities. So, and this is where all of our partners are so important. So we have over 50 partners, many private, public, and other expert groups. We have some law firms on board. The IP Innovation Clinic is also on board, and this is uh, the clinic that I started back in 2010 to really help under-resourced inventors and entrepreneurs start up. And because part of Connected Minds is true, and Trish, you mentioned this, to get ahead of it, right? To come up with socially responsible technology, ensuring that we have those social impact assessment guidelines in place early on, as opposed to, you know, at the end where, you know, it's widely adopted and everyone is um, getting on ChatGPT on the speed of light. So that's kind of what we're trying to build in. Again, the foundation is important. And here, um, you know, as an example, I, um, Mid Journey, for instance, right? Mid Journey is that image based uh, Gen AI platform. 
which had it consulted indigenous communities, I don't think that what would spew out on the other end would be these most stereotypical and discriminatory images that we've seen come up. So our approach um, really has to be a different one where we consult with the very communities that are sidelined. And so we talk about EDI also in Connected Minds. So what we did there is that we established this indigenous advisory circle where if there's any, any kind of project or grant that touches anything indigenous, it will be scrutinized by the indigenous advisory circle and they have a veto right. It will not pass the smell test. And we need to do this because we see projects proliferating at the speed of light, which again are causing more incursions and unfairness in, in society. So this is something that we need baked in our foundation. And I have to say over the last year, since the announcement, I've been like, my days are just blocked up with meetings, uh, trying to get terms of references on all of our adjudication bodies, all the calls that we've put out, because essentially what we are, we're a fund. So we have all this money and we do have money. And this is money for all of you to think about how you can access it and work together. So right now um, we've completed our first adjudication round. Uh, we have uh, seed grants, PhDs, postdocs, and some uh, actually at this conference have been funded already. And um, we have smaller grants, travel grants, prototyping grants, large team grants, which are going to be announced $1.5 million. Um, we have research enhanced hires, chair appointments that we're working on. And so I'm, I can't wait for the next iteration of this to report back um, many of those uh, success stories. It's really an exciting time because um, we are seeing that there are more from all different areas now coming together that you wouldn't otherwise, like I never thought I'd be working with neuroscientists and here I am. So I think we need this cross-pollination to, to tackle these big challenges. And the law needs to play center stage uh, at this nascent stage. And so we say that we have this co-creation, co-led approach where any project has to have a community partner, an industry partner, and the researchers involved to ensure that we have that uh, panoply of, of uh, you know, different interests represented. Um, so that's a key takeaway. Think about Connected Minds, and I'm happy to chat offline on any line about Connected Minds. Um, also, I wanted to just mention the Center for AI and Society, and the reason that's a New York center, and the reason that came about was because I was involved in this task force with now my inaugural co-director, James Elder, and he's a computer scientist. Um, and we found that this was about four years ago, that there were so many incredible researchers across the university doing AI type work, but everybody was kind of siloed. So the reason um, CASE, as we affectionately call it, came about, was to really bring together this, this you know, disparate community and to work collectively with other centers, right? With Nathanson, any, any other center, but we need to ensure that we have um, also the unity in our, uh, in our approach, even as diverse our voices are, because we need to build that bench strength. Uh, Bracing for Impact is one of the conferences that you know, we held last week, and we started looking at issues of law and AI and ethics. This is back in 2018. So this continues, and in this conference, we had Case, Connected Minds, and the clinic join forces. And I'll just end with one other development that landed in my inbox yesterday. Um, and this is called the AI Roundtable of York University. And it's um, chaired by the Vice Provost of Teaching and Learning. And there are terms of references really looking at the um, different researchers and structures and committees and all of what is going on within the university to ensure that we have um, a clear vision and a mandate and that the supports are there. So if I could just read um, this Roundtable will review and advise on policies, guidelines, and strategic directions for the responsible use of AI technologies in research, teaching, and administrative functions across the university. So that's just starting up. So just to say that there's so much going on in the AI space, 
within the university in the law school. And um, it's really a, a prime opportunity for each of us to be involved and elevate our work in all different ways. So I'll end there and I welcome uh, the discussion. Thanks a lot, uh, Pina, grazie mille. And, and now uh, our uh, final speaker of uh, today, and we are really delighted to have here and welcome here um, Molly Reynolds. Um, Molly Reynolds is a partner at Torres. Uh, Torres is one of the most important business uh, law firms uh, here in, uh, in Canada. And um, Molly Reynolds' practice is uh, about uh, cybersecurity, data security, and uh, privacy, if I'm not wrong. So uh, she's an ideal uh, speaker for, for our conference. We are super happy to have her here. Thanks a lot, Molly. You have the floor. Thanks, Valerio. Hi, everyone. Um, so I do come at this, as you say, from the private practice perspective, and in particular, the large firm perspective, which I appreciate is not representative of all lawyers' practices. But I thought it might be useful to add to this conversation the perspective of three issues that within the firm we are actively worrying about and planning for and trying to develop approaches to when we think about you know, the impact of AI on the legal profession. So we won't be focusing as much on the sort of external um, you know, advice and, and issues that we see. And those three issues that I think are really on the radar internally within the law firm now are developing the new approaches to training our students and lawyers, which you know, Trevor and Trish and several others have already touched on, um, vetting within the firm AI tools that are provided by third-party vendors for legal work, and at the same time, managing our clients' requirements on when and whether we can use those tools. And the third one, which has been an issue for over a year already, it's very hot right now, is the impact on privilege and the impact on lawyers' liability for the advice that we give to clients when clients are inserting AI tools into our conversations and our advice. And that picks up a lot, I think, on what Amy was talking about in terms of these features that are embedded in Zoom and all kinds of general um, software. So I'll just give a few more details on sort of what we're grappling with with those issues, um, which is not to say we have a solution, but also just you know how we're thinking it through um, when we're doing it on the ground. And all of it will be with a view of not getting on Glenn's radar here. So, um, you know, picking up on uh, Trisha's points, really, you know, I think we have a good history of legal innovation um, to look back on to try to figure out the impact of a lot of the AI and the generative AI tools um, on our junior associates and our students who are, you know, developing their skills for the profession. And frankly, it has been a really slow process, right? As Trish said, like we've been doing e-discovery for 25 years. There is still a huge amount of lawyer time, substantive legal time that is spent in any e-discovery project. And we have very sophisticated tools and we are those sort of, you know, big firm uh, bodies that have all of the resources and we are still engaging our lawyers and our students in huge ways. And yes, there have been efficiencies, but we haven't lost the role of the lawyers and the students in that context. Um, very similar trends over the last 10 years with AI driven um, due diligence and corporate transactions and um, smart contract drafting, smart pleadings drafting. So I still think this is going to be a longer process of seeing the impact, and there's going to be a lot of room for lawyers to continue to be involved. Um, but very similar to what Trevor led with, I mean, we are concerned, and I think we are going to need the next five to 10 years uh, to really develop our internal training programs that are going to help teach our junior lawyers, what makes a persuasive document? When you're reviewing an AI generated factum or a contract, what makes it point first? All of the things that we really emphasize and focus on in what we consider to be quality drafting in any field of practice. And, um, you know, I don't think that we are resistant to having secure and reliable software starting that. But what do we need to replicate in terms of workshops, experiential training? Um, and I think also through transition of 
um, more qualitative and ephemeral knowledge from more senior lawyers so that the more junior lawyers who are tasked with reviewing these initial drafts um, really understand how to weigh and to critique it. And of course, as a profession, um, when we think about law society programming, when we think about external CPD providers, there's room to do that. But within the firm too, we need to think about um, how we are gonna roll that out. And I expect that there's gonna be so much trial and error very similar to the approach that we've taken with making sure that our junior associates have trial advocacy skills when there are so few trials that we're going to need many years to really refine this and work on it. So that's sort of the first um, area that we're actively thinking about, might not say worrying, but, you know, starting to plan for a little bit. Where I will say worrying <laughs> is the second point I mentioned. So um, the process of piloting AI tools that are developed by third-party vendors or service providers. Um, and very importantly, as Amy said, the process of keeping a handle on all of the AI features that are being rolled out in our existing firm software without our consent and without our notice is many people's full-time jobs. It is a huge area of focus for the firm. And when I try to think about applying that to the small firm or the sole practitioner context, it gives me a lot of concern because you need people who have a lot of expertise and who are effectively technology experts focusing on this, not just lawyers who are trying to manage their software subscriptions and run their practice. Um, and you know, we are already seeing a huge tension between clients who are coming to us proactively and saying, we want you to reduce costs and increase speed, and we want to know what advanced AI tools you're using in your practice. We're seeing them in um, requests for proposals. We're seeing them in conversations with existing clients. And at the same time, we are getting extremely direct messaging from the corporate clients that we largely serve, prohibiting us from using their data and the work product that we generated for them in almost any AI tool and prohibiting us from applying generative AI tools to legal work that we are creating for them. So, um, you know, I think about how many larger companies are coming to our firm and saying, you know, we are very concerned about this and we are explicitly instructing you not to do this. And then I try to think about the context of other um, legal practices uh, who might be serving smaller companies or serving individual clients where they're not getting those very explicit instructions, you cannot do this, and where the lawyers are not proactively going and asking for permission to do so. So I do think we're you know, concerned internally and a little bit more broadly from the profession about what does it mean to get instructions to use these tools in our client work? Um, and how do we make those instructions meaningful, right? So in the larger firm sort of commercial client context, you know, I think a lot of us are looking at updating engagement letters um, and having very explicit consent processes for any tool we want to apply because we think it's going to be efficient in a particular file. And the way that I would try to adapt that outside of that commercial context to individuals, I think is a real challenge for discussion to make sure that your individual client actually knows what you're asking and can exercise a real choice in these instructions. Um, the other piece there too is that is a big obstacle, I think, for the larger firms in really moving forward on adopting tools after we pilot them because of the challenge of segregating data. So it is largely impossible to um, use an AI tool that might improve the search results on your document management system if you have even one client, let alone 50% of your clients say, you can't use AI on any of my work product. We can't separate the document management system. So I know this is much more logistical than many of the other speakers spoke about, but they are the real issues we've already been grappling with. And as much as we have, I think, you know, a very considered approach and a lot of expert folks who are dedicated to piloting the AI legal tech um, that's gonna be useful for us, the rollout is going to be slow because all of our clients need to be comfortable before we can make some of these really big um, strides here. So the other 
um, point I just will touch on briefly is um, is the third one around, you know, the effect on firm liability and the effect on privilege. Um, at, at sort of a high level, there, there are four points, but I may only cover two of them. Um, in particular, with the AI bots and the meeting summary services that we're seeing in all of the Microsoft Teams, Zoom um, software that, that Amy was mentioning, that are not just um, tra transcription tools, but are really there to summarize the main points of a discussion, to give emotional sentiment analysis, to even give analysis of the attentiveness of the participants in the meeting. Um, there are privilege concerns and there are a lot of litigation concerns um, that have already come up. So first of all, we're creating, or the client who's inserting this tool is creating a record of a legal conversation where there previously wasn't a record. And by no means was it a um, sort of overarching record as opposed to one person's notes. And so now we have, to Trisha's point, a huge trove of additional documents that might be relevant in discovery. Um, and many times the client users who are joining these meetings with these bots don't really understand what vendor is creating these records and where they're being stored and for how long. So they are not really co competent to assess whether they are waiving privilege over that legal conversation. So we've got net new documents of potentially very sensitive discussions um, with counsel that are more exposed than many of our existing communication channels to waiver of privilege arguments, and that may actually be disclosable to regulators in litigation, in access to information requests. And we have you know, a lot of um, organizations that are implementing these tools, and then when the individual users come to speak to counsel, not really aware of the risks. So I know I'm really running short on time here, Valerio. Um, I'll, I'll try to wrap it up and I, I won't cover maybe all the other issues that I see with this particular one. But in terms of just the approach that we're taking, I mean, we are having to do a lot of education for our lawyers to tell them what these tools and these bots um, actually look like, how to spot them, what sort of their speaking notes are to raise the issues and the risks with the clients. And also, most uncomfortably, how to have really difficult conversations about the limitation of the law firm's liability on um, work product that the client is sort of putting in to generative AI. So if they are relying on a summary of a conversation because they didn't attend the meeting and the legal advice that is summarized is wrong, we need to be very explicit about our responsibility for that. It is not like sending over a legal opinion in a PDF that is signed by the lawyer. Um, and again, you know, I think challenging to have those conversations with in-house counsel at sophisticated legal client, uh, sort of uh, sophisticated corporate clients. But when I think about having that conversation with smaller um, organizations, business people, individual clients, and making sure that they actually understand that. And then I think about all of the conflicts that are gonna arise from these liability disconnects and land on Glenn's desk. Um, that's probably one of the top areas of focus for us right now, and I expect it will be for several years. Thank you. Thanks so much, Molly. Uh, again, this was uh, fantastic. And uh, it was really a fantastic panel. I'm mindful of the time we will have to end at eight uh, at 6.15 sharp to relieve our IT uh, help. Uh, but I think that there are uh, some uh, issues and questions that come up from uh, all the discussion uh, today. One important question is about training how do we train students how do we train articling students how do we train junior uh, lawyers uh once ai promises to be able to do a lot of the basic work that normally was the work with which people started their practice when i uh, when i was a trainee so our version of a uh, of an article student, we will start to do uh, due diligence uh, and it was completely boring and uh, dreadful, but we learned how to do things starting, starting small. Now, if the expectation is that uh, you start at the partner level just out of uh, the law school, well, who is going to teach you uh, to do what needs to be done to get to, to the partner level? 
the other the other thing that I think is very important, and I think this also resonates with some of the uh, last remark, the, the, the Molly's uh, remarks, is uh, we are probably risking to have a double tire or multiple tire legal market in which the big companies, the big uh, clients, will have access to the best lawyering possible. And for the rest of the, the people, we will have only a commoditized version of uh, legal help that is uh, help with AI, assisted by AI, but it's going to be uh, deeply unreliable and problematic. And I think we should really reflect on how to avoid that this double tired reality uh, emerges linked to, to, to artificial intelligence. And uh, this also um, uh, connects with other uh, things that uh, many of you have said. And uh, I am somehow of the opinion that there is the risk that lawyers either resist too much to the technology and reject it, uh, or accept its overripe, accept it at face value. And this will be equally dangerous. Uh, so um, before giving back the floor to you all and uh, whoever wants to, to pick up on, uh, on any of these things or say uh, a few more things, uh, you're very welcome to. Uh, I just wanted to conclude uh, by this, this part of the panel by saying that at Osgood, we are, start, we are thinking about this uh, quite broadly and we will have a mini course on uh, AI that all our students will be able to attend that will uh, teach them what AI actually is and, and will demystify and explain what AI is. And this is gonna be a, an important part of our curriculum uh, in the future, and we are very excited about it. Uh, is there any, anyone uh, in the panel that want to uh, pick up on, on some of the things that I've just said or want to add some thoughts? Trevor, please. Valerio, just on your two-tier point, and I don't have an answer to it, I think it's a really interesting question. And some of the stuff that Molly was talking about was really getting me thinking about a bunch of things. One thing that I personally need to remember when I'm thinking about this sort of these some of these issues is, you know, if we think about uh, the um, the way people resolve problems, certainly in this country, and it's consistent with others, when we look at the research, you know, less than 7% of cases go to courts and tribunals and less than 20% of legal problems go to essentially to lawyers. Uh, uh, with the flip side of that is there's a huge amount of unmet legal need and unresolved legal problems. And the sort of the role that AI can play potentially regulated, not regulated, assisted, not assisted, but to Pina's point around, you know, the society and the, and the role laws playing. I just think we somehow have to get our minds around that because I often fall into the trap of talking about that tip of the iceberg where, where most people are in this country is nowhere near any of us and messing around with the stuff of life that, that really could use some help. Um, and I think that's a real opportunity for lawyers. But I also think we may probably will, as Jillian Hadfield would say, we're never going to have enough lawyers to, to service all that legal need. So trying to think through what we do with AI to, to, to help that, I think, is an interesting question. Maybe just to, to build off Trevor's point, I think, I think he's absolutely right. And one other kind of thing I always try and emphasize in these conversations is that, you know, for good reason, we're thinking about AI, particularly generative AI right now, but there's a lot of technological solutions within the justice sector that don't necessarily involve AI. So just having better court forms, for example, that may be digital and interactive. You're not going to necessarily use an AI tool for that. You may automate it, you know, will building tools, all kinds of things, getting better legal information out there. And so, um, and of course, then there's a whole world of, you know, people who may not have digital access to think about. But um, I, th I think sometimes um, we get excited with the latest and greatest and, and there's more simple solutions we can think of as well uh, that we still haven't had a chance to implement. So um, I think it all has to be part of the picture, but let's not forget uh, some of those, you know, more simple fixes um, or simple uh, measures uh, still involving technology and, and you know, some technology that can do some pretty amazing things, but it's not necessarily a chatbot. bot. Um, and now that Trevor was suggesting that, but it's always good to remember, we've had a lot of tools for a while that we still aren't using uh, as effectively as we could.
Thanks a lot, Emmy. Uh, any anyone else want to share some final thoughts? I can give you a one minute anecdote to pick up on Trevor, Trevor's point. Is we have um, a number of files that involve self self represented defendants. And I will say in the last two years, there has been a noticeable change in the type of correspondence that we get from them. And I don't know for sure, but I think many of them are supported by the free version of ChatGPT. And it's not to do their legal documents. It's literally just negotiating or organizing schedules for a motion. And, you know, from the lawyer's perspective, I think it's wonderful because they may just be putting in the prompt of what they want to say, but it's coming out in a way that kind of aligns a lot more with the process. So there are some, you know, early examples that even we're seeing of some of those benefits for people who just, you know, aren't having legal advice to start with. Thank you. Uh, unless there is anyone else that want to uh, chip in uh, at the moment, I think we have enough uh, on our plate to uh, wrap it up. Uh, I would like to thank everyone, uh, the speaker of this roundtable, uh, but also all the speakers of the previous sessions. And uh, again, my colleagues, Professor Chudori and Liel Gonzalez for supporting and organizing this conference. And of course, Osgood and Dean uh, Trevor Farrell for their tremendous help uh, so far. Thank you again so very much. Uh, this is gonna uh, be just the start of the conversation. So stay tuned. There will be a lot of other wonderful things that will happen at Osgood in York. So stay tuned. And again, thank you so very much. Valerio, thank you. Thank, thank you, Valerio. Thanks, Valerio. See you later. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Hey, Molly. Nice to see you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. You terrified everybody. me, Molly. Everyone. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. See Bye. you soon.